when the Russians get another victory frenzy, and they start writing on the cars we can do it again, we are going to catch the Germans, to Berlin. It is worth recalling that there were times when the actual slogan was to Moscow. There were times when foreign troops stood in Moscow, and now we are not talking about the Golden Horde Khan Tokhtamish, not about the Crimean Khan Devlet Jurai, and not even about the French Emperor Napoleon. And about the times when, with the assistance of Ukrainian Cossacks, Polish-Lithuanian troops stood in Moscow. In Russia, they remember this, but do not like to remember. In Ukraine, they do not remember, but in vain, this is the story of our victories. This is our historical history. This year, it seems, only the deputy of the Lithuanian Saimas, Arvid Zainashauskas, proposed to celebrate the 410th anniversary of the capture of Moscow, and he proposed to celebrate it even to Russians, as a day of liberation from the oppression of the illiterate nobility. It is even surprising why the Russians refused to celebrate such a remarkable anniversary. After all, it was a historic chance for Muscovy to change its history and follow the European path of development. We will tell you how it happened and tell about the participation of Ukrainian Cossacks in those events. Hello to all who watch Ukrainian YouTube. You are on the channel History Without Myths, I am Vladlan Muraev. Friends, I remind you that our goal is 100,000 channel subscribers by the end of the year. Please support us by subscribing, liking, commenting, sharing the video on social networks. Let's start with a historical excursion, since without it we will not understand what is there and why. The position of Muscovy at the beginning of the 17th century was extremely difficult. In 1598, Tsar Fedir Ivanovich died, who is considered the last representative of the male line of the Rurik dynasty on the Moscow throne. Power passed into the hands of noble Boyar families, first the Godunovs, then the Shuiskis, but they failed to establish a stable dynasty. The power of the Boyar kings was not considered sufficiently legitimate. And in addition, the country's situation worsened significantly due to terrible crop failures and a famine that lasted for several years. All this caused numerous popular uprisings, in which peasants, Cossacks, and burghers took part, that is, in general, the country was in a very serious economic and political crisis. At this very moment, a more realistic contender for the Moscow throne appears, Dmitro Ivanovich, the youngest son of Tsar Ivan the Terrible. In Moscow historiography, he is called False Dmitri. False Dmitri I, because it is believed that the boy actually died at the age of eight. And the one who pretended to be him was simply an imposter. However, it is impossible to unequivocally prove or disprove this fact. In 1605, Dmitro Ivanovich, or False Dmitri I, took Moscow, by the way, with the help of Ukrainian Cossacks and was on the Moscow throne for a whole year. Then a popular uprising broke out in Moscow against his government, and he was allegedly killed during this uprising. However, immediately after that, rumors began to spread that the wrong person was killed, he did not die at all, but actually escaped. In 1607, Dmitro Ivanovich appeared before the people in Star Dub. In Moscow, where Vasil Shuisky ruled at the time, he was immediately proclaimed false Dmitri II. However, a huge part of the territories of the Muscovy Kingdom swore to this false Dmitri II, or Dmitri Ivanovich, as he called himself, and many cities recognized him as their legitimate ruler. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth did not officially intervene in those events until a certain time, as it had a lot of problems of its own. By the way, what about the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at the beginning of the 17th century? It would seem that this situation is much more stable. The chosen monarch has been on the throne for a long time, this is Sigismund III. However, to paraphrase Shakespeare, not everything is so cloudless in the Danish kingdom, in this case in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. There are a lot of nuances. First, the ruler Sigismund, he is a Swede by origin, a representative of the Swedish Vesa dynasty, and his main goal is to add the Swedish crown to the Polish and Lithuanian ones. That is why he relentlessly fought against his uncle, King Charles IX of Sweden. And this moment is very important in order to understand the intricacies of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth's policy in relation to Muscovy. 
Secondly, Sigismund III actually dreamed of strengthening personal power in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And that's why he usually met opposition from the nobility and the government. Just on the eve of the Moscow War, Zeb Didovsky's rebellion took place in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Yes, in this country the nobility had a legal right to rebel against the monarch if he violated their rights and freedoms. Some rebels, by the way, even intended to overthrow Sigismund III from the throne and replace him, who would you think? Dmitro Ivanovich, the same one who in Moscow was called Lzedmitry II. Zeb Didovsky's rebellion was suppressed, but the country's situation remained difficult. Thirdly, Sigismund, seeing the difficult situation of Muscovy, dreamed of taking possession of its crown for himself or for his son Vladislav. However, the government did not provide funds for the military campaign. Why? It was simply afraid that a new war would strengthen Sigismund's position and contribute to the strengthening of his monarchical power. Our great historian Mihailo Rushevsky wrote about this. But Thijimund, eager for conquests and triumphs without a government decree, with an empty pocket, with the state machine broken by the barely calmed rebellious turmoil, rushed into the Moscow adventure. And he needed troops, as large as possible, as inexpensive as possible, as possible in credit. And where to look for it if not in Ukraine. The reason for the start of the war was the conclusion of the Treaty of Vibert between Muscovy and Sweden. The Swedes provided the Muscovites with a corps of mercenaries under the command of Jacob Delagardi. Sigismund, who fought against Sweden, perceived this as an unfriendly step and in the fall of 1609 entered the borders of the Moscow Kingdom. The main forces under the command of Sigismund himself, full hetman of the crown and governor of Kiev Stanislav Skevsky and the great chancellor of Lithuania Lev Sapiga. Smolensk a super-powerful fortress that defended itself for almost two years, was besieged. Undoubtedly, Poles and Lithuanians lost time under the walls of Smolensk. However, they often ask why they didn't go to Moscow right away? The answer to this question is already related to what I said earlier. The government of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth did not provide funds for this war, as a result, Sigismund managed to bring a very small army with him, from 8 to 12,000 soldiers. With such an army, he decided to begin with a small one and try to at least conquer Smolensk, which the Grand Duchy of Lithuania lost in 1514th year. Of course, with such modest forces, Sigismund hoped very much for the support of the Ukrainian Cossacks. As Rushevsky aptly put it, the help of the Cossacks was especially valuable to the government, the least demanding, the most ready to serve on uncertain credit, to make up unpaid wages with requisitions, contributions and simple robberies. The more the government's resources for the maintenance of the Polish army were exhausted, the more important was the help of the Cossacks for him. On the side of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, both registered and Zaporozhian Cossacks acted in this war. Information about their participation in the war is rather fragmentary and requires a separate special study. However, it is known that Ukrainian Cossacks were active in the areas of Chernihiv Shiversh China and Star Dubs China. In October 1609, 10 to 30,000 Cossacks under the command of Hetman Bodin Oligshenko came to Smolensk. A year later, more Cossacks under the command of Daniel Kalinik approached Smolensk. The sources of those times preserved the names of colonels, Cossack colonels, participants in the war against Muscovy. Andrei Gunchenko. Fyodor Kanish. Mikhail Maksimovich. Alexander Makovsky. Gregory Poshkevich. Andrei Storoshenko. Mihailo Kvostovitz. Matthew Shirai. Kozich. Nalavyko. Starinsky. In general, according to Samuel Mashkevich, a participant in the events, a nobleman of Belarusian origin, about 40,000 Cossacks took part in the war against Muscovy. A colossal force, especially considering the fact that the Polish-Lithuanian army was much smaller in number. De facto, Chernihovo Shivers China and Star Dubs China were controlled by Ukrainian Cossacks, not Polish-Lithuanians in those years. However, the authorities of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth were in no hurry to pay the Cossacks for military service, and therefore they were forced to repeatedly remind it about themselves. Returning to the Ukrainian Cossacks, 
I will quote a fragment from a letter to the Lithuanian Chancellor Lev Sapiga, written during the siege of the city of Pochip, now the Bryansk region of the Russian Federation. In general, it is very interesting to read the documents of those times, because, for example, they attract attention with extremely beautiful forms of address, absolutely necessary, inherent in the etiquette of that time. Just listen. The only thing that worries us, noble and gracious sir, is that we do not have the tribute demanded from the king. For although there is a letter of reference, it is not said whether they will be willing to pay us, it is not indicated how much per man, it is not said for what amount troops, because we now have up to 15,000 troops and more, in the end it is not said, to whom and how and in what place, the one who remains alive after performing the bloody service will receive this divine payment. This is what we want. Therefore, we humbly and humbly beseech your grace, our gracious Lord, to let your grace, our gracious Lord, report this to his royal highness, and be himself the gracious cause that his royal grace, according to the conditions of the aforesaid letter of account, deigns to provide for us. When we receive it, our heart will burn even more for the services of his royal grace and the commonwealth. It is also necessary to take into account the factor of the third force. Look at the configuration, Sigismund III near Smolensk, Vasil Shuisky in the Kremlin. But you haven't forgotten about Tsar Dmitry Ivanovich, the same one who has already appeared from the dead twice like a certain Kenny McCormick, and who in Moscow is called False Dmitry II. So, he stood with his army near Moscow in the village of Tushino, which he turned into an alternative capital of the Moscow Kingdom. In the Kremlin, he was contemptuously called Tsarok, or Tushin Thief. By the way, the word thief in those days did not mean someone who steals, but a state criminal or traitor. So, Ukrainian Cossacks also served in his army, even up to 13,000 Cossacks, according to contemporary sources. However, when Sigismund III appeared with his army near Smolensk, these Cossacks, as well as some Polish and Lithuanian nobles who supported Dmitro Ivanovich began to move from Tushino to Sigismund's camp near Smolensk. In the summer of 1610, the Kremlin's so-called Tsar, Vasily Shuisky, decided to destroy Sigismund and sent the main forces against him. The trump card, which Shuisky was counting on, was the Swedish mercenary corps under the command of Jacob Delagardi. However, what Vasily Shuisky really hoped for is not entirely clear, since the mercenaries have not been paid enough for a long time. Accordingly, they had no motivation to fight. And Sigismund did not wait for the arrival of the enemy. Without removing the siege from Smolensk, he sent part of his army to intercept. This part of the army was commanded by Stanislav Skivsky. On the 4th of July, 1610th year, a general battle took place near the village of Klushino in the Smolensk region. This is one of the greatest victories in the history of Poland, Lithuania, and one of the most shameful defeats in the history of Muscovy. And for us it is important that it happened with the participation of Ukrainian Cossacks, Ukrainian nobility and other immigrants from Ukrainian lands. Another interesting coincidence, the first cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin was born in the village of Klushino after more than three centuries. Judging from the balance of forces, the battle of Klushin for Stanislav Skevsky was a pure adventure and should have ended in a complete disaster. From three to seven thousand soldiers were at his disposal, among them about four hundred Cossacks. The Muscovite Swedish army numbered from twenty to thirty thousand, and with all the reserves up to 50,000. However, it was mainly infantry, while under the command of Skevsky mainly cavalry served. Mostly, the famous winged hussars are heavy cavalry that specialized in breaking through enemy formations. Zalkievsky acted extremely decisively and brazenly. After passing through the forest at night, at dawn he suddenly attacked the enemy. At the height of the battle, the mercenaries of Delagandi, and among them were the Swedes, French, British, Italians, Scots, Germans, Flemish, refused to fight for Moscow, because they had not been paid money for a long time. 
some of them declared neutrality, some generally went over to the side of Zolkievsky. And the Moscow militia, very poorly prepared, just ran away in a panic. Stanislav Zolkievsky won an outstanding victory with minimal losses. The next day he wrote a victorious relation address to Sigismund III. The battle lasted at least three hours, with variable success. But the Lord God, according to his mercy, blessed that, after the scale of the scales tilted several times, then to their side, then to our side, the fearlessness and courage of the troops of your royal majesty overcame the enemy, first the Muscovites rushed to flee, and then the foreigners. The warriors of your royal majesty chased and destroyed the foreign cavalry, rode on their shoulders to the enemy's camp, and then drove them into the forest. Shuisky's camp was large and magnificent, Shuisky's own carriage stood here among the rest of the wagons, we captured his sword, helmet and mace. The consequences of Klushin were grandiose, first of all, the collapse of Tsar Vasil Shuisky. When the news of the defeat reached Moscow, the boyars themselves overthrew Shuisky and made him a monk. The Moscow junta came to power, which much later historians named Semiboyarshina. Secondly, in a month the army of Stanislav Zolkievsky approached the walls of Moscow, and the boyars gave him Shuisky and his two brothers as prisoners. The former Tsar was taken to Smolensk, where the camp of Sigismund III was, and then, when Smolensk capitulated, he was taken all the way to Warsaw, where he was subjected to a shameful ritual. He was forced to fall at the feet of the ruler of the Commonwealth of Nations and recognize his supremacy. There, in captivity, Vasil Shuisky soon died. Thirdly, the Moscow junta had to choose who it would be better to surrender to, Zolkievsky, or false Dmitry II, Dmitry Ivanovich. They chose Zolkievsky. Why did you make such a choice? And because false Dmitry II, or Dmitry Ivanovich, we don't really know who he was. He enjoyed popularity among the common people. The boyars were afraid of this. They hoped that the Polish-Lithuanian army of Zolkievsky would protect both their status and their power, influence, and their property from potential looters. As a result, in October, 1610th year, at the invitation of the Moscow boyars, Stanislav Zolkievsky brought troops into Moscow and the Kremlin. I emphasize that he entered there not as an occupier, but as an ally, at the invitation of local authorities. Fourthly, Semiboyars China signed an agreement of historical importance with Zolkievsky. Vladislav Vaza became the Tsar of Muscovy, the 15-year-old son of Sigismund III, who was called Vladislav the Jamontovich in Moscow, but on the condition of converting from Catholicism to Orthodoxy. In fact, it was the union of the Commonwealth with Muscovy, a point of bifurcation, after which history could go a completely different way. Example Muscovy could get closer to Western European culture. Tsarist despotism could be limited in favor of the power of the nobility on the model of the Commonwealth. By the way, the population of Moscow and so many other cities swore allegiance to the new Tsar Vladislav Vaz. What do you think, dear friends? In the 1610th year, did Muscovy really have a real chance to embark on the European path of development? Write your thoughts in the comments. However, the realities turned out to be different. Vladislav did not convert to the Orthodox faith and did not come to Moscow. Considering his teenage years, he was very dependent on his father, Sigismund III, who wanted to declare himself regent under his son or even Tsar of Muscovy instead of his son, and very much wanted to join Smolensk directly to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This caused a conflict between Sigismund and the Moscow boyars, and the same of the Commonwealth traditionally refused to finance further hostilities of Sigismund's troops, in fact, simply threw his army and Muscovy to the conscription of fate. Polish-Lithuanian troops in Moscow, including a Cossack detachment, found themselves in a blockade. Against them stood the so-called first militia, then the second militia of Minyan and Pashersky, to whom a monument was erected on Red Square in Moscow much later. History has made another heartbreaking coup. Now the Polish-Lithuanian troops were defending Moscow from the rebels who refused to recognize the legitimate Tsar Vladislav Sejemontovich. 
they held out in Moscow for two whole years and, in the end, capitulated not because of defeat in battles, but because of the failure of logistics, lack of support from their own people. The inability of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to supply the fresh Moscow garrison and, as a result, a terrible famine that even led to cannibalism. Polish colonel of Belarusian origin Józef Budzilo vividly described the situation. When this famine began and there was no grass, roots, mice, dogs, cats, carrion, the besieged ate the prisoners, ate the dead, digging them out of the ground, the infantry ate themselves and ate others, hunting people. Infantry Lieutenant Truskovsky ate two of his sons, one Hydek also ate his son, another ate his mother, one comrade ate his servant. To put it simply, whoever could eat whom, he ate that, the healthier got the weaker. For a deceased relative or friend, if someone else ate it, they were judged as an inheritance and it was proved that the closest relative should have eaten it, and not someone else. I watched a lot of these. Some devoured the ground beneath them, gnawed their hands, feet, and body, and worst of all, they wanted to die as soon as possible and could not, they gnawed on a stone or a brick, begging God to turn it into bread, but they could not take a bite. Well, what about the Ukrainian Cossacks? As already mentioned, they were paid little or not at all. Therefore, somewhat paradoxically, the Cossacks were interested in the war in Muscovy lasting as long as possible. After all, this created ample opportunities for looting and contributions. Cossacks carried out destructive and lightning raids, which are impressive in their extent, from Chernihiv Oblast to Karelia, Novgorod, Vologda, Arkhangelsk. Arkhangelsk, Karl. Just imagine, Ukrainian Cossacks almost on the coast of the Arctic Ocean. At that time, the Cossacks practically did not take into account the orders of the Polish and Lithuanian commands, it did not pay them, and continued to raid even after the conclusion of a truce or a peace treaty. It was unrealistic to smoke them from the Moscow region, and for years they terrified the local population. An outstanding Ukrainian historian, researcher of the history of the Zaporoshan Cossacks Dmitry Yavornitsky explained the origins of the attitude of the Ukrainian Cossacks to the Moscovites. I draw your attention, these words were written in the Russian Empire at the end of the 19th century. The difference in historical fate, the difference in culture, language, clothing, and rituals made the southern Russians and Zaporizhia Cossacks in many respects different from the Great Russians. Both in outward appearance and inwardly, South Russians were more similar to Poles than to Great Russians. It is this that can explain the enmity that the Cossacks showed towards the Great Russians. As is known, 1613th year, the Zemsky Sabor, contrary to Vladislav Vaz, chose Mikhail Fedorovich Romanov as Tsar, thus establishing the Romanov dynasty on the Moscow throne. However, Vladislav continued to use the title of Tsar of Moscow by order of his father, Sigismund III, even a special Muscovite crown was made, which they periodically used. Vladislav tried to seize Moscow and overthrow Mikhail Romanov from the throne in order to gain real power in the country. The consequence of this was the military campaign of 1618th year, in which the Cossack hetman Pyotr Konishevich Sahayadakny was especially famous. However, this is a somewhat different story. Dear friends, if you are interested in the topic of Sahayadakny's trip to Moscow, write in the comments and a special issue will be published about it. Do not forget to like the video and subscribe to History Without Myths. Thank you for your attention, see you next time.